Hello and welcome to this free episode of free one. Milo's back. back. I'm back, baby. He's so back. And I'm Mango Mouse. <laughs> yeah, he's back yeah. and he's Mango Mouse. Um, that's right. Look, there's been a lot that's been going on recently. Uh, as per usual, uh, we have a lot of old friends to visit today because boy has some stuff been happening. Yeah, it's sort of like a trash. Oh, it's gonna be like a Marvel movie. Yeah, or like a trash future, like alumni reunion. You know, you, mm. you, you come mm. on the startup segment, you graduate, and now you're going to come back and we're going to see how you're doing, you know? Yeah, like like Zoom Pizza is coming and hanging out at its old high school, going mm. to football games and stuff. Oh, yeah, we've got to go and see Baby Gronk. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna riz him up. No, no, we're not. No, we are not going to do that. Yeah, because Livy's already done it. Yeah, no. Um, I, I we we had our our business meeting um earlier this week, mm. and uh, I forgot behind the curtain one core thing to discuss. Which is, nope, it, that the Spectator and Telegraph have both gone into administration Sad. as the Barclay brothers are unable to pay their Sad. creditors. Mercy so, for the Barclay brothers. I, I, I think that's a real shame, you know, because where else mm -hmm. would I get to read warmed over, like, Britain first Facebook posts? But the Telegraph and well, the Spectator. It, it's very funny to imagine, like, a, a creditor's fire sale of the Spectator. Like, Morgan Stanley coming in and going, we'll have tacky, $50,000. <laughs> yeah. Well, they've got that well, one big conference me, table. Toby Young. They've got the big, beautiful yeah. conference table. So that they'll get some uh, money yeah. back oh, for that, at least. We should buy that. Well, because we do have a, like, sort of slow burn plan to start filming the episodes and putting them on YouTube. If we had the Spectator's conference oh, it, table. Like, the, oh, yeah. the trophy that is the hunt. <laughs> That that would be if we had gotten the little like bird sculpture from like when Elon was selling stuff from Twitter, mm -hmm. that would have been great. But I, I'll settle for this golden arm. Yeah, to do. Yeah, to, yeah, to, yeah. To podcast. We have these like makeshift tables that yeah, like aren't really tables. We're just like bits of wood <laughs> put together. That was <laughs> such a great moment where I was pushing Hussein's microphone towards him and he was recoiling away from it. It's like, yeah, <laughs> what yeah, the, yeah having like... done this for like years, what the fuck is this thing? No, I, having, <laughs> every, this time, time, every time I go this to the, the studio... This is the first time I've noticed. Mm. This is the first time I've noticed I have to talk into something. Mm -hmm. We've had these tables for a long time. Like, we didn't make them. We sort of like took them from another guy who made them out of scrap wood. I feel like it's time for us <laughs> to get a nice oak yeah, like a spectator beautiful table. mahogany table. That I imagine unspeakable things have been done to, done on that table. Oh, yeah. Stuff stuff Near has it. been taken off of it, stuff's been put on it, all, all manner of things. But like the thing I, I imagine I imagine quite a bit has been put onto it and then tapped in, yeah, into a line yeah, yeah. with a credit and, card. And then inhaled. Mm. Yeah, but like I will get this sentence out yeah. if it fucking kills me. The thing about going to the studio that always amuses me is so much of it is just bits of wood or like stuff you found somewhere. None of the chairs have <laughs> armrests and like they're covered in like. They're all taped up. Yeah, I don't understand why they're taped with, like, on the, on the armrests. Tape. They're taped up with like police caution tape. <laughs> At any time I'm in the studio, I'm like, how? How did you? How did you accumulate all of this shit? Did you get all of this out of like different skips? <laughs> The answer is because we stole a lot of it, <laughs> and we've passed the yeah. savings on to the listener. We literally, we stole so much of the furniture. I also furniture, do think that the but guys- from landlords, yeah. so it was yeah. ethical. Yeah, I do also think that those landlords did probably get a lot of that stuff from the skip. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so this, sorry, this, is, this is TF- yeah. This is TF Business Meeting, I'm calling TF Business Meeting to order. I think we should buy either or both of the Spectator and or Telegraph. The only problem with the furniture from the Spectator office is it's nice, and I do think we should buy it, but I think it's probably all possessed by the ghost of Hitler. <laughs> yeah, oh, but, yeah, so we could be under danger of creating yeah, the recruitment Hitler podcast. Yeah, the Hitler particles sort of like very dangerous. I think we should mm. we should buy both. We should launch all of our like video content whenever we do that under the like auspices of the Spectator. Like, The Spectator mm -hmm. is just us doing video content. And then The Telegraph, we bring back your attempt to mm. do textual journalism again with gettingyourdicksucks.com. <laughs> so we're going to buy The Spectator and call it Getting Your Dick Sucks. No, 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 we're going to keep The Spectator sucks. The Spectator. <laughs> the Spectator stays The Spectator. Although I actually think... I think we could buy the Spectator, yeah. and then like, what are they famous for? What does everyone know them for? Oh, the parties. Garden Party, yeah, the Garden Party, yeah, yeah. And I and mean, I was gonna say racism, but yeah, <laughs> yeah that, 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 that too. too I so, guess. well, 
remember there was that there was that uh, awesome meme about a dial that you could turn from racism to techno, and it was like you should turn the dial from racism to techno. Oh, you want to have a techno party? Yes, in the well, yeah, of course he does. Of course he does. He wants to get fucking like one of his DJs. He wants to get David Guetta in the fucking party. <laughs> David Guetta. David Guetta. You know, I, I think I, I, don't I, know I don't know. DJs. Probably. <laughs> is, is that I'd not a good pick one? Someone, but- <laughs> well, I, I think it would be very funny to get like I don't know to throw the worst party ever and have like David Guetta and Ben Clark going anyway, back to the just no, 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 heard about Toby Young. No, no, he's had a tough year. His wife's left him. Riley. Anyway, shout, shouts out to his family. Riley, <laughs> so just, Riley, oh, not, not back to back simultaneously. We get them like <laughs> o- opposite sides of the garden playing like adversarial sets, and that's what the spectator is. Is that happens like. Like four times a year, yeah. everybody fucking hates it. It's the most annoying party in London mm. by like a wide so, margin. So you what got we're... the norovirus in the spectator garden party <laughs> dark room. What you're suggesting <laughs> is essentially a kind of white people version of a sound system battle. <laughs> Basically, yes, yeah. yeah. There'll be hoons doing burnouts uh, in the middle of the party. We need to purchase these media properties. They are <laughs> lying fallow so in the hands of the current owners. If you're listening to this, up your Patreon subscription, <laughs> yeah. and we will buy the spectator. So, so anyway, we we will watch Succession, and um, <laughs> we have some ideas for it. You know, like how all the sort of business guys we like uh, mm. just misunderstand every film. Mm, yes. Mm. We've done that with Succession, and we're like, yeah, this is a great idea, let's buy the Telegraph. I've done that with DJs. I'm I'm so so wounded that I just, I said the first DJ that like came to mind, and every single one of you was just like, this is... I just thought you were doing a great bit because you knew that Riley would be so insulted at the suggestion that he would book David Guetta. Precisely because Riley used to like David Guetta and that's why he would find it so viscerally. Yeah, when I was like 17. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. yeah, The most embarrassing year of anyone's life. True. Uh, Look, look. So, I'm sorry, we had to, everyone had to hear TF business meeting. It's just, when an opportunity like that comes up, we have to like... We owe you a fiduciary duty to discuss it. As our shareholders. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to move on, though, uh, because uh, a a few other friends of ours have had some developments. The SEC in the United States has begun... (laughs) Friends of the show. Yeah, friends of the show, the SEC, uh, have begun initiating lawsuits against um, Binance, Coinbase, and other crypto exchanges, asserting that, in fact, everything they do is trading securities. Mm. Cited in Ah. the evidence that Binance was aware of this was a... um, a Slack message from 2018 that said the following from the from the CCO. Is to that the, Slack the proper noun or Slack the adjective? Uh, the, pro, the, the proper noun. The <laughs> uh, CCO admitting to the Binance compliance officer in December 2018, bro, we are operating a fucking unlicensed security exchange in the USA. <laughs> yes, <laughs> mate. Self-incrimination chat with the boys. Like, the, the group chat where you incriminate yourselves in bigger and bigger crimes. Yeah, this is like un- unless they were just doing one of these like meme group chats, like oh, let's all post like boomers. That's essentially what the crypto guys cannot stop doing. Well, yeah, because so they good. they see they see those types of posts that are like tell us about a crime that you committed and never n- and never got arrested for, and they will tell you everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, <laughs> this feels like the same yeah. thing. They don't know about. They love talking posts. about their crimes. <laughs> yeah, is it like that? He's like, "Yo, that's my grind set. I'm I'm establishing an unlicensed security exchange in my sleep." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, additionally, as well, Coinbase, uh, the the cryptocurrency exchange, uh, headed by just powerhouse of charisma, Brian Armstrong, mm-hmm. um, has suggested that Lance's brother. Uh, what we have is that uh, once again, yes, in fact, everything, including U.S. dollar coin, like. Which is I don't know eighty six percent of their revenue, like some huge amount of their revenues. None of it is shit coins. None of it is utility tokens. It's all securities, all ah, of it. Oops, and so, amazing. All yep, securities. Whoopsie Daisy. All of it apparently. All of it. Everything they were doing apparently was dealing in securities. Astronaut and, meme. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's very funny. And, and a lot of the usual suspects, of course, have been re- like like fucking Andreessen uh, and similar people. Uh, are reacting to it like oh, oh Balaji especially. I love that fund, Andreessen and similar people. <laughs> well, <laughs> Andreessen, the indie band, Andreessen and others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Andreessen, Balaji, Andreessen, et al. yeah, Andreessen, the guy who wrote the like Stormbreaker. Uh, some other guys <laughs> yeah, yeah, possibly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
So <laughs> and Andreessen and the Whalers. <laughs> so uh, Andreessen and the Whalers, uh, Balaji, all these people. Um, they <laughs> they are saying that uh, oh, this is just another another attack by the by like the the woke state trying to defend itself. The woke state. Yeah, against. Um, Call me Janet because I'm yelling. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> got that. Got that. They them SEC. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, like, it, but this is... Uh, I actually identify as a securities exchange. Mm. <laughs> um, they could try that. Yeah, so this is now, um, one analyst uh, covering Coinbase has declared the company to be uninvestable. Amazing. <laughs> so, uh, you know what? Oh, so we own Coinbase now, too. We're, we're consolidating our portfolio. We're going to end up with the Telegraph... The Spectator and Coinbase and an oil yeah. warehouse and FT yeah. and every single yeah. one of those Spectator things is going to have a different DJ. Exchange. Yeah. Oh no, not that many DJs. Yeah, they uh, well they they need to bring in Baby Gronk. Mm -hmm. They're going to need a lot of Riz if they're going to shake <laughs> off this uh, incriminating stuff. So so I have more I have more for you from uh, revisiting some old friends. Um, I don't want to alarm either any of you or any of you listening okay. as well, but. Mm. Is this like a content warning? Do we have like a content yeah. warning? Um, on this? So content okay, warning. This one was jarring, jarring shifts in tone. We yeah. we go to the like the serious bit now. Uh, Zoom, which raised three hundred seventy five million dollars from SoftBank to automate pizza making with robots in the delivery vans, has shut down. Oh what? Yeah, yeah the woke state hates the round pizza box. <laughs> yeah. This is so sad. In a long oh. day. <laughs> Without you, my friend. Uh, Alexa, I play the sound of like a robot cooked pizza falling out of the again. back of a van yeah. onto the street. Family. <laughs> I've just been Diesel yeah. looking through the window of a truck at a pizza that's somehow driving yeah. a truck. <laughs> I am astonished that it has yeah. lasted this long. I, yeah. I thought it had shut down already. Yeah, to be I kind of forgot about it. It comes in my head every so often because I just mm. love, yeah. love the idea of the round pizza box. I think it was like one of the funniest things that ever showed up on the show. So, so, so. they they were like operating this in like like one town in like was it like Rochester or like Providence, some shit like that in like the northeast. No, that Wasn't was it? a different Wasn't competing it? robot pizza company. <laughs> Wasn't it in Oops. North Caldwell, New Jersey? No, Wasn't that a weird element no, of it? That was another competing <laughs> another one <laughs> robot pizza company. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Called Wonder. How's that one doing? Is that is that one doing well? Do we okay. think? So I did I, because I I was reminded of this wave of robot. <laughs> I mean, not just the wave of robot pizza making. There are companies spending accumulative tens of billions of dollars trying to automate pizza making and not even like mm. the difficult bits like like making the dough or whatever they're just trying to automate the assembly of a pizza and it's never fucking good but i so i looked into this as well seeing that zoom had somehow failed after trying to be valued at two billion dollars and being called the amazon of food by alex uh garden its uh ceo so <laughs> <laughs> this is inventor of the garden. Yeah, this yeah, is the yeah, one yeah. from New Jersey called Wonder, which was invested in by Mark Lore, one of the LinkedIn guys. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the inventor of backstory to him. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah and, very good. Um, thank you. <laughs> and at other like celeb investors. So this is according to the, the the reports this week in the Wall Street Journal, food delivery startup Wonder is laying off employees and will begin to phase out its signature food delivery trucks in the hopes of creating a lower cost operating model. This is from like January of this year, so it's not. It's all kind of happening within the same Things six months. Things weren't months. looking too good for them back in January. Yeah. But then <laughs> Wait, turn so, that so, around so, now. It's, it's a pizza truck startup that's not going to have trucks. Well, they didn't just do pizza. It was a mobile kitchen that you order food and it finishes it outside your house. And then they run well, the food so from the truck. Stupid. Of course now it's they, stupid. Now they don't, but now they don't do that anymore. So... The, Okay, so have they just like invented a, a kitchen? So it says this is this is what this is the Wonder Chief Governance Officer Andrew Gasper. We loved the vehicles. But... Andrew Gasper is constantly shocked. <laughs> we love. He's the... like, <gasps> oh, it's my balance sheet again. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> we loved the vehicles, uh, but we couldn't figure. We figured out a better way to do it. Uh, informing the journal that the current model would have required another billion dollars of investment over the next two was years it, to scale. Was it building a kitchen in a fixed location? <laughs> Once we figured out the technology and started testing it in a brick and mortar location, we learned <laughs> all of the things we could unlock. Our quality was already very high, but we could make the food taste even better and be more efficient in a stationary bricks and mortar location. Crazy. Crazy. Almost, almost as if it's more efficient 
cooking a pizza or whatever the fuck in a kitchen instead of in the back of a van driven by a robot. How much money did it cost them to figure that one out? Uh, collectively for the entire automating like delivery food uh, and cooking uh, it in the truck industry? Somewhere between zero yeah. and two billion dollars, I no, presume. No, more than two billion because oh. two billion was the enterprise valuation of just Zoom. Ah. Wonder, on top of that, also had an enterprise valuation, I believe, in the low billions. Uh, and then there's the whole long tail of other companies that are also trying to do this. Amazing. So billions and billions and billions of dollars, at least in like paper value, uh, investment value, <laughs> just hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not over well, a billion. Well, I presume though that this business, you know, they've not just shut down, they've pivoted, right? You know, because now they are a dealership that sells off a bunch of used vans. A bunch of used vans with a bunch of weird shit in them. Yeah, that's that right. doesn't work. Dead robots. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a turnkey business, and then you turn the key, and inside is a dilapidated factory. Yeah, great. You can turn the key. Uh, no, so um, he's like nineties. <laughs> it reminds me of old country. So it says we can get the food to someone's house at basically the same time as the food trucks if the order is large, and the larger the order gets, the more that one person in the vehicle had to do all this balancing act. Now we don't start cooking the order in our location until we're sure a courier is ready to go. So what they have is they've invented a dark kitchen. Yes, that's fucking. They've invented Pizza Hut or yeah. like Domino's or whatever. Yeah, well, but no, what they did is they re they used billions of dollars to A B test and reverse engineer the idea of a kitchen. Yeah, they they've derived Incredible. the restaurant from first principles by starting from the concept of the van. Well, which is a weird place <laughs> to start, but I mean, yeah, I guess they've worked out how to make a pizza by first understanding the fields of van logistics and robotics, and then been like, oh, you just need an Italian guy in a building. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't need in either of the two things we started from, but that's okay. We're here moving uh, fast. We're breaking things. You know in order to make a pizza, you must first invent the known universe. And they did. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, it's, I really do love the um, kind of boil the ocean approach to making a cup of tea that a lot of the startups mm. seem to take. It's, it's the same thing with the crypto people. They created all of the sort of features of the um, modern financial system kind of by accident and through a huge amount of scamming and failure, sort of from first principles <laughs> with magic yeah. internet money. Like, they, they keep on... Because these people are everybody involved in this entire industry as just such a decrepit imagination, they can mm. they, they try to transform life in ways that are imaginable from just sitting in your house and staring at the wall, thinking, well, what do, how do I interact with the world? Pizza and finance. All right. Well, how can I make mm. those more efficient? Just it, the fever dreams of a particularly unimaginative child. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. What if a robot had a van in it that was making pizza? Uh, Zoom uh, says, the, um, the, the, the article on Zoom concludes, Founded in 2015, the company was one of many attempting to use robots to make pizza. The concept never took off, and the technology <laughs> was plagued by technical challenges, such as keeping melting cheese from sliding off the pizza while it was being baked in moving trucks. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Like it's, it, I think what's so funny about it, and I think this does apply to the crypto stuff as well, is the way that they're not only trying to reinvent the wheel, but they're trying to reinvent the wheel precisely because everyone else is using the wheel, and they see that <laughs> as a downside. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh, well, uh, no one else has got a blunt knife. We're going to invent the blunt knife, the flat, the flat sided knife. It's just like a rectangle, because <laughs> like, no one's ever done it before. And it's like, yeah, there's a fucking reason why they've never done that before. Yeah, it's very... You've removed the useful feature of the knife. That's, that's a very Keir Starmer policy as well. It's yeah, like replacing yeah, yeah. the sharp mm. knives with the blunt. We're going to replace them with blunt knives. We're yeah. going to give all of the children in the county <laughs> lines gangs rubber knife, <laughs> so that they can take out their their anger and their you know. Which I understand why they're angry. You know, a lot of them have had difficult lives up to this point <laughs> and, uh, with the absence of of sure start. And I think that you know, if we give them all a rubber knife, they can take out that energy, and then eventually learn to work together to perhaps start a small accountancy firm. <laughs> yeah. Well, how about this? How about this? Taking away the right knife. First step, rubber knife. Second step, paintbrush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Third step, tapenade vape. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, there is a plan, by the way, uh, that's being taken forward to continue uh, the uh, outlawing uh, 
vapes with two attractive names like sweet jelly donut or whatever okay or, or, or tap Gross out. Donut. I mean, what, 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 what are you gonna vape at the combination david gasser ben clock garden party it's gonna be called like gay pussy donut that's gonna be the new oh, and, and now some other people are into vaping it's not really it's not changed the overall number so it's the um this is in uh sorry so in new zealand that they're doing is they're outlawing um overly attractive uh vape names so yeah it's illegal to be too cool yeah it says no oh, you, enticing you can't, you can't call a vape tight little pussy vape here in new zealand it's not allowed you gotta call it something like ordinary vagina <laughs> <laughs> big loose pussy Awful. Big loose pussy. you gotta call it big pussy bump and sarah here in new zealand yeah, the big loose pussy vape. <laughs> <laughs> we right. we finally found a way to get me to start vaping. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Anyway, um, moving on from all of that, that BLP. <laughs> uh, I feel like we're totally yeah, with BLP. Yeah, the British Labour Party. <laughs> we are absolutely in the right Doesn't frame. Stand of... for anything else. We are absolutely in the right frame of mind <laughs> to move on to our uh, our next subject here, <laughs> which is here. <laughs> Here in Auckland, honking on that, honking on that big loose pussy. <laughs> I know people are going to write in and say that it's not a very good New Zealand accent. I know that's going to happen, so I'm preempting that now by saying I don't care. <laughs> honking on that, <sighs> honking on that hairy gooch. <laughs> It's just, it's just raspberry, actually. That's, that's the flavour, but you can't call it that anymore. <laughs> right, right, let's go on to the next. People, people, people are queuing up to get that South Island man boob. <laughs> Riley, Riley's head in hands. He's actually laughing so much he's sweating. <laughs> okay, I'm oh, alright. I'm alright. Right. I'm alright. All right. I'm good. I'm good. Are we resetting? Do the next. Do the next yeah. segment. Do you say next segment before he continues? Save, save, save us all. From <laughs> Milo coming up with an unappealing vape name in a New Zealand accent next. <laughs> oh fuck me! Oh, well, I'm on that Christchurch stick cheese. <laughs> okay, next segment. Yeah. Okay. All right, yep. everybody. Mm. Yeah. Yep. All right. Yep. We're all growing yeah. up. Yeah. We right? are. We're growing we are. up because the ne- we're talking uh-huh. about like neoliberalism and stuff in the next segment. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. You you said to me you said to me when we did the planning for this I want this one to be a bit more grown up because it's going to have a lot of theory. <laughs> yeah. The neoliberalism flavored vape for the real grown up. Oh yeah. The seawater. Yeah, it's means tested. Somehow. All right, so basically, basically, there's I, I've been doing some some thinking recently i've been mm. I, i've been reading actually a lot there's been a new ft series on starmerism how he sort of came to take control of the party reevesonomics what they're trying to do how they see it in relation to the states um and, yeah, and which for, for us is a little bit like going what type of knife is that in my back like what's the sort of yeah, shape of it what's the so hand funny like? that someone as boring and forgettable as rachel reeves gets to have an anomics named after her that's well, like such a weird quirk of history don't worry when i describe what it is you will see that it's quite fitting i mean consider um, the consider the fact that we nearly had a long bailey nomics yeah that would have been hey that would have been a, an improvement but it would have been, but yeah. like consider the sort of like the implications of long Bailey nomics. Yeah, Honking name. on that long Bailey nomics. So, 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 <laughs> look, um, and I think this is also comes into the discussions that you see every once and again of people claiming, "Oh, neoliberalism's over," or "No, it's not." Blah blah blah. Um, yeah, the pantomime crowd of British politics. And <laughs> and uh, I I think that you know it's worth worth thinking about something like neoliberalism in our case rather than like as a governing ideology. Uh, or as a set of concepts through which to understand a governing ideology. And I think that it is a number of things have come together. Uh, it is dusk and the owl of Minerva is spreading its wings. Um, and we are able to... <laughs> the, yeah. the weirdest vape flavor of all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's... yeah, you have to say the whole thing every time. The label kind of like wraps around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like a spiral written up the tube. So, and that you can... And there, there's now, over the last couple of years, there has been, and you can a lot of writing about 
the way to understand how the economy is organized and how that might be different. I'm not necessarily one of these neoliberalism has ended people, but I am increasingly thinking that a different set of concepts is needed to understand the same groups of people achieving the same goals in different conditions. It's not ended per se, but it has gotten funkier. <laughs> well, sort of. Yeah. yeah. So I, thanks in large part to Liz Truss, I will yeah. say. I really think she's been sort of the grave digger of it in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, well, I say like the, it's, um, if you think about, remember how neoliberalism, sort of the side governing, world governing hegemonic ideology started, it was an energy, mm. pri- it was a response to an energy price crisis that was precipitated uh, by the Six Day War when Saudi Arabia then decided to, uh, Uh, cut oil production to raise prices. All that money flowed uh, into huge amounts of money flowed into London denominated in dollars. And then the banks in which that money was kept then loaned that money to developing countries at extortionate interest rates on behalf of like the Saudis. Right. Mm -hmm. And because the oil price was up, the interest rates were also up to combat inflation. It's one of the ways you had stagflation. Right. There's inflation not coming from growth, but the huge spike in energy prices. The way that and that created a mistake. That hmm. created, among other things, the logic of austerity, which was kind of invented in like the IMF Washington consensus, which starts out at the periphery, right? When we start saying, okay, well, you've ta- you Tunisia, you've taken out a loan uh, from the, you now have a structural adjustment program from the IMF because the interest rates are so high and you've borrowed so much, mostly to pay for energy, right? You're basically trapped yeah, in this and, situation. And, yeah. And now every Tunisian has to work until they're 90 or yeah. whatever. And so this, so IMF structural adjustment is one of the, it's, this is one of these things that starts out on the, on the sort of global uh, periphery and then makes its way back to the imperial core. This is like, oh no, yeah, that's the last thing I wanted to add. That's where I live. <laughs> right. And at the same time, right. The promise, I keep all my stuff, yeah, yeah. the promise my of like, items. the promise of participation in like politics, capital P to govern and improve life is sort of curtailed. Um, at the same time, international free trade areas uh, sort of deepen and expand as finance capital. Uh, is able to create these gigantic globe sprawling supply chains, which are like the main deflationary force from that time on. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I like the sort of the summary of neoliberalism, uh, both for future archaeologists, but also in case any of you came in late and like mm-hmm. you didn't you didn't see any of this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Riley, how is all this happening when the British people in 2019 voted resoundingly not to go back to the 1970s? <laughs> that was like the main thing they said that they went. And look at where we are. We're yeah. in the 90s. Yeah, you've got hair growing right now. <laughs> the collar is enlarging as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> this man's got chest hair. <laughs> so he's offering have, me cocaine from a mirror. I do have chest hair. Legally, uh, he isn't doing that. Uh, but so, but so then, what happens is finance oh, capital. Legally, he is finance <laughs> capital. Uh, sort of in its great ascendancy for then several decades, freed from territoriality by communications technology and eventually the internet, just is able to cover the world in this way. So you're able to perform arbitrage on everything. So all labor uh, tends to be um, exported through like these various free trade agreements. Or like production in China as it, is, as it joins the WTO is able to like supercharge the destruction of American manufacturing, yada, yada, yada. Right. Mm. This is the apogee of like that governing ideology is the accession of the China to the WTO, which then blows up eight years later. And it's been being replaced by the next thing for mm. uh, over a decade now. And it's taken kind of covid to get people to notice. That's why I say, you know, the owl of Minerva spreads its wings at dusk. You can only really see it as it's ending. Um, you can sure. only really I, understand it, it. like <clears throat> combination of like COVID and also uh, the, like Ukraine uh, <laughs> and the you, like new incipient Cold War with China yeah. and but, like a lot of it. So much of it comes back to energy prices as well. And it's like it's genuinely remarkable to me how much it's sort of like there are three or four numbers that change. And then the ideology like it, it when, once those change, like rolls down a dice tower and a new ideology is generated yeah. to like fit those things it's basically ideology plinko uh, yeah but like genuinely to go from like mercantilism to uh to like to capitalism to globalization to uh to neoliberalism to now whatever we're gonna call this new mm. thing it's it's really it, it sometimes it just feels like it's like it's three numbers mm. that just go up and down. Well, that's you know? that's a big part of it. I mean, the reason that food prices are so high in Britain is because food prices in Britain are a proxy for energy prices because so much of our mm. shit is grown in greenhouses heated by natural gas. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And there's no better way to heat greenhouses. Oh, we're gonna get to that. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> this uh, this all all by way of saying is that the neoliberalism was a particular reaction to a set of particularly favorable conditions for finance capital, basically, 
uh, in the last sort of what 50 years you might want to call it. It's had a billion different and it, it doesn't mean that you have some kind of like minarchist state. So the state intervenes in lots of different ways. Just it likes to disguise its intervention like neoliberal industrial policy is carried out through bailouts. They pick winners by creating little monopolies and then say, oh, you're, you're providing a service on behalf of the government, yada, yada, yada. Uh, the, and what's happened, as we said, right? It's is, a government that hates governing. Yeah. It, or the government that makes a big show of hating governing. And, mm -hmm. to, and the, no one allowed me, I couldn't possibly govern. And it doesn't, and the, the, the sort of collapse of that system in the face of high energy prices and also like, the fact that giant globalized supply chains are now a security, considered a security threat by these people, right, means that, A, you no longer have the deflationary impulse of those long, long supply chains, but also it means that you're so all of a sudden, you can't depend on things being produced anywhere in the world anymore, from energy to face masks to anything. So, uh, uh, basically, you have to have a Computer governing... chips, yeah. semiconductors. Yeah, things of that nature. It's so cool that the main semiconductor fab is right on the fault line of the, nuke, of the second Cold War, by the way. That's awesome. It's, and, it's, it's, yeah. great. it's great world building from the riders, I have to say. It really <laughs> adds a good yeah. bit of jeopardy and there. And so, uh, these changes mean that I think you need a new set of concepts to understand the global economy, and certainly is now a hegemonic belief on pretty much both sides of the aisle in Canada, Australia, much of Europe, and the UK, and then among the Democrats in the US, and the, the Republicans will catch up when they sort of forget the culture war stuff. Um, but the underlying <laughs> desire among columnists for this like ideologically squared Brexit or Trumpism, or the, but also the, it's, it's responding to, I think, this, this idea. Uh, it's also the same thing, by the way, the, um, like that Lord Crudus's book about the dignity of work, Bidenomics, Revenomics. Uh, the Power Australia uh, uh, program, mm. all of this stuff. Power Australia. Yeah. yeah. All <laughs> it's like it, Australia it, it, when it's like mm. evolved. The endless waffle about the somewheres versus anywheres of the new elite. What oh, yeah. generally they've been tall talking about is the endless coming Endless waffle is a new vape flavor, but from like Hades. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, you like the waffle vape, do you? <laughs> yeah. But... But this is all really gesturing at the, around the sides of a political program where the role of the state and private capital in the economy is changing. But most of these people are pundits and too stupid and myopic to see it. They're too, and, yes, but yeah. well, it's sort of like the particularly the Crudus thing is interesting to me because it's uh, we're going to see the labor right try and finesse this mm -hmm. right uh, and to try and like spin this out into a thing where they can do all of the stuff that they want to do. I think that they're too stupid to do it. I, th I think that what's going to happen is they're going to be overtaken by circumstance, mm. and the big fucking new ideology is going to descend on them, and all of these people who are now talking about what great Blairites they are are going to have to embrace whatever the next thing is, because mm. it's going to be sort of like forced upon them. And, and what, the, what's, what is coming, I know, what I seem to sort of see is coming next, and I've done some reading around this as well, and this is, again, a concept that's been written about by a couple of years, mostly by economist Danny Roderick, who's sort of for it, it seems, is, is referred to as productivism. Uh, mm. it, it is. Do you remember yeah. the sort of like all of the times on the show when we've talked about some measure where we've gone, ah, it seems that once again, a government that claims to hate governing and especially hate socialism has been forced to do a, quite a socialist piece of governing and then loudly complained about it the whole time. And they've done sort of like just enough to kick the can down the road mm. for another like six months or whatever. You remember all of those times? Mm. <laughs> I do. The bill is kind of coming due on all of those, right? And eventually there gets to a point where y you gotta do something. Mm. And that's going to be accompanied by some kind of crisis, as with like energy supply or whatever the next thing is going to be. This winter is going to be very interesting, and by interesting I mean terrifying, because the NHS is going to fall over, and that's going to be a crisis in the health sector that like you can only solve with massive government intervention. And at some point, this like knots together and it, it like agglomerates into an ideology where it's like, no, the government is reliably just doing all of the stuff that it hates. Right? That's the new thing. <laughs> Some people say it's going to be a terrifying winter for the NHS, but we here at the government prefer the word interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think that's also important to say, right, is that this is the same sort of hegemonic group of people in power who are doing just different oh, sure. things to achieve the same goals as as before. Yep. Yep. Uh, the only difference maybe is that like some some slices of capital of uh, like finance versus productive like ones some are coming more into favor like these things have been in conflict for a little while um and so the, the world of productivism that we might talk about is in many ways just as stupid and cruel as neoliberalism 
and it is as oh, good. Yeah, it is as concerned with um, it is as concerned with residualizing public services and so on as well. This is again like a both sides of the aisle thing. It is still allergic to things like public ownership. It just has. It is an acceptance, essentially, that certain outcomes cannot be left to the market. I think the best way to understand it is an application of the way that Western countries do defense spending to more stuff. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. And I, I think a lot of it, you can, you can say, if you don't want to concede that it's not neoliberalism now, you could think of it as wartime neoliberalism. Yeah. Uh, because the combination of China and Russia have like and climate. kicked all of these people and the climate so far up the ass that they're like now legitimately starting to think about things in terms of threats to the state itself. Mm -hmm. uh, which, if you ask me, uh, I, I know this is not like a popular framing as a leftist, you know, because we don't like the state that much necessarily, but like it's a bit late. Right. Uh, <laughs> given that the shit is already happening and has been for a number of years, it's it seems like maybe earlier would have been nicer to take that view. Well, it's the the, the way that mu so much government has actually happened ever since the the efforts of the nineteen seventies and eighty or nineteen eighties mostly was to sort of denude government of the ability to do things directly. Right. It was mm. all of a sudden you became a service. You became a service uh, provider. You were a contracting organization, but very rarely, like, it used to be that a power employee, someone working at a power plant was a government employee, no longer. Someone who, so the government employee- Well, now they some, work for the French government. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, or the government employee is someone who contracts with the power company, for example, right? So the, um, and so the, there's been an enormous amount of that kind of improvisation happening sort of all over the world. So, of course, it was too little too late. And, you know, the other thing to remember is that the people who are now trying to implement what you might call wartime neoliberalism are dyed in the wool neoliberals. You know, the mm. exception being that there are fewer of them in America, which is why the Inflation Reduction Act, well, it had much of the things that were going to make it, um, make the sort of America a nicer place to live, such as many of its like care provisions just immediately stripped out. Why at least Can't it's, have that. at least it's effective in directing public investment towards the things they want to direct it to. The UK, of course, does not have that benefit because we need jobs for the boys. Oh, we do. We've got to have jobs for the boys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is this is a, a series and we're, of, and we're yeah. also true believers. We are the people who will like cut the police and the army and stuff. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. The, but British neoliberals put their money where their mouth is. I do want to make a suggestion here, though, which is that I think you know wartime neoliberalism sounds a bit cool, and I think we need to. We don't want this to happen. So what we need to do is employ some uh, New Zealand government logic. You know, we need to give people a nudge not to subscribe <laughs> to this ology by calling it a uh, big loose pussyism. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, and the thing about the thing about big loose pussyism, right, is that like I think Riley has been slightly imprecise earlier when you said um, that it, it's gonna like organize different sectors of the economy like we organize the defense sector. I think there's an imprecision there. I think we should say that it's gonna organize sectors of the economy like the Americans organize their defense sector. <laughs> yes, excuse me. <laughs> so wow, lots of is, dumb guys doing nothing. This is from an essay by <laughs> kind Danny, of yeah. yeah. This is from an essay by Danny Roderick on productivism, uh, which he thinks, I, I think not incorrectly, is basically the animating impulse of Bidenism, Starmerism, the thing that Tories were trying to articulate with leveling up, what you're talking about when you talk about good jobs, the dignity of work, whatever. And we're talking- Guys, we've got to get the economy XP grinding. <laughs> so, Christian- We're going to get a buster sword. <laughs> Christian, Christian Freeland is talking about it in Canada, it's cross-party popular in Australia, um, and so on and so on. So- Let's hear from Roderick. He says, if history is a guide, the vacuum left by the waning of neoliberalism will soon be filled by a new paradigm. This is an approach that prioritizes the dissemination of productive economic opportunities throughout all regions of the economy and segments of the labor force. It differs from what immediately preceded it in that it gives governments a significant role in achieving that goal, putting less faith in markets and is suspicious of, of large transnational entities. Now, again, like, I think Roderick has missed a trick here by seeing that governments did play a significant role in achieving the goal. They just hid that role, or they would play it in the back end through stuff like bailouts. Yeah, but there is there is sort of like more appreciation for some central planning. Mm -hmm. I, in sort of like thinking about this, I thought about uh, a lot about the early cybernetic system, CyberSign, uh, in Allende's Chile, where it was like, we're going to have like a centralized computer system that's going to direct the stuff where it needs to go and manage all the resources and all the supply chains and then all the shit like that in order to like, you know, consolidate the nationally important stuff and uh, you know allow it to be planned in a way that's uh, sort of like more sustainable 
uh, and then the fascists bombed it and so on. But like, I think of I think of this kind of as like capitalist cyber sign, right? Less, much less cool, but mm. it's that I, I think that's also something that's going to speak to the like technological implications of this as well. Is they're going to have to find something that will allow them to like play that off as you know, it's not central planning anymore because we're using this you know this shit. Yeah, whatever well, it is. And the you be you wouldn't be surprised to know that AI comes up a lot. Right, fantastic. So fish finger of GPT. Is. Of course it does. Uh, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so Roderick goes on. It emphasizes production and investment over finance and localism over globalization, but it also departs from the Keynesian welfare state, the paradigm that neoliberalism itself replaced, in that it focuses not on redistribution, social transfers, and any kind of macroeconomic management, a what? but rather creating economic opportunity by working on the supply side of the economy to create good productive jobs for everyone. So it is supply sideism, but in the knowledge that we need supply sideism to create certain outcomes. It's not enough for us just to have an independent central bank moving like the interest rate lever that like gets you evicted. We have that the, mm. the state has to take a slightly more activist role. And that's like that's yeah. different enough to warrant a different set of concepts. Yeah. Well you've got I, the I interest like rate lever and you've got the racism button and that's what they've got in number ten. They don't have anything else. We've, we we're introducing a new lever here, which is the, and I'm sort of capitalizing uh, the G and the J here, the good jobs lever, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the vision here, and particularly on sort of like on the right of the left, right? Uh, you know, the center left, whatever you want to call it, is <clears> like everybody's going to have a good job. And that good job is going to pay for the public services that you don't have anymore. So, like, yeah, the healthcare is shit, but you're going to like top that up with the like healthcare premium that you get from your good job. Mm. The food is going to be expensive, but you'll get like a subsidy from that from your good job or whatever. Yeah. Well, and specifically, the thing to remember about all of these these programs, right? When you're when you are issuing the idea of like fairness and justice in the economy and trying to have have that be a proxy for something else is that it never really works. Because if you recall, everyone was going to be computer programmers or social media managers uh, until about 2018 or 19. Everyone was going to do we that. We were all going to learn how to code. Yeah, we were all going to learn how to code. Yeah. All, the, the idea, really, this is... I was going to be the new drip king. The idea <laughs> it was I was going to be rizzing people up. The idea was that all of the factory <laughs> workers who were laid off were going to retrain as something else. And the, the same <laughs> logic is, is being applied here, but instead it's like, oh, you're going to retrain as someone who builds windmills. You're going to retrain as... Um, Jolien Moore. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're gonna, but you're gonna retrain <laughs> yeah. as as some kind mm. of like a green energy person, but yeah. that Which never really like, materialized. Yeah, and and like it's not a horrible idea as far as these things go. Like the Green New Deal was a good idea in the broadest sense, but what you know, one crucial part that needed to happen before it could ever be, or anything like it, could ever be adopted by by mainstream politicians was a way to strip even more public services out of the country. <laughs> But also, the green, the green New Deal was a way of decarbonizing the economy that was focused primarily on what people's experiences of it would be, and then in de-risking ourselves in the future by taking these things into public ownership. The Green Prosperity Plan, which we're going to talk about a little bit more, Rachel Reeves is much vaunted, but already being attacked for being too expensive, 28 billion pounds, to basically decarbonize the entire economy. Um, that is mostly going to be private subsidies to companies, uh, startups, things of that nature. Cool. So the Green Prosperity Plan, total value is, uh, is often talked about as 28 billion pounds. It's actually a bit more, it's 28 billion pounds per year for five years. Like a lot of pledges like this, especially in ple pledges to spend in places that are, even though they're talking about wanting to spend, are still internally hostile to spending. Uh, let's see how much it shakes out at, but that's the total figure that they're planning to work with. I was going to say because twenty-eight billion pounds to decarbonize the entire economy sounds pretty cheap. Oh well, yeah, because the the other tenet of productivism is that it does industrial policy through de-risking, right? Um, and so you you create enough um, public investment in something to then remove the risk for more private investment coming in. It's kind of PFI, but they've called it something else. Oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> Remember how good that just one was? Like, it went so well yeah, before. Just sort of looking at Starmerism and seeing the ways which, because again, like I think that's that's all well and good, or it isn't, but I think again, it's going to be overtaken by events, right? And I, I think we're going to be looking at you know, ten years time, fifteen years time, we're going to be looking at a prime minister, whether that's you know Starmer, his like chosen successor, 
uh, the AI that used to drive the pizza truck that has now sort of like achieved sentience. Or oh, whatever. where's streeting? It, yeah, exactly. And it's going to be claiming to still be a Blairite, and we're going to sort of look at it and go, well, there's, there's very little like private in this public private mm. finance. Mm. Well, the um, problem with PFI was people didn't like it, and I think a lot of that was down to the confusing name, which didn't really take off. So I think we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna give it a re- a more reassuring name, like uh, don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, or, BL- like or BLP. Pussy That's stuff. right. Yeah, so. who, who wouldn't love a big loose pussy? It's, it's roomy, it's capacious. I'm trying for fun's yeah. sake. There's, so. there's room to take a nice book with you. So, the weird, the weird thing, right, is that this yeah. is trying to do what you might call Bidenism on mm. the cheap. Mm. It's trying oh, okay. to do Bidenism, but without spending oh, classic like classic Britain. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say it's very classic Britain. But the funny, the funniest thing of all, I don't know if this is funny. We've picked this up is... Bidenism in the Middle Isle of Lidl. <laughs> it's called Tesco Yosef Value. Boyden. <laughs> 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 so, and it's got a free scuba diving mask in the box for some reason. So the weird thing is, though, right? And and follow me on this: that because yeah. the U.S. is spending so much money mm. on all of this, these things. That incre- that it increases the prices for all of them. It increases the prices yeah. for like batteries and and the equipment to make wind turbines, which means Solar that panels. our yeah. A, yeah. our attempt to do Bidenism on the cheap is going to be made even less effective because we're going to be able to buy even less of what we need. So the amount huh. of the amount of actual spending power that we can direct towards this thing, which already is a fraction of what we need, is going down rather than up. It's almost as though we should have done all of this stuff ten years ago. Yeah, would have been would have been sort of a little uh. A little bit liberal, don't you think? Do you remember when we could bor- bor- borrow money at like zero interest rates, and you know, but, but a lot of people weren't investing loads of money in stuff yeah. like wind farms yeah. and solar panels, and, and so that well, stuff see, was we, cheap. we had to put we had to put all of that money into a series of scams. Oh because, yeah, flim uh, flams. Yeah, I remember those. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We had to do that in order to provide entertainment for people who listen to this podcast. Yeah, we were building this big pyramid. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to the listener. The whole thing has been a stitch up by us. Yeah. We made <laughs> successive Tory governments do that stuff we so that we would Marble be able Arch, to entertain yeah. you. We did the Marble Arch Mound, even. That we was did. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is from... built some solar panels. Instead, they took that money and at our mm. behest, they built a sort of like low poly hill. They said, hey, we could put a few solar panels on the top. And we were like, no, no, no. <laughs> it has Actually, to don't be pointless. Want you to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. This is Reeves talking to the Financial Times. <laughs> we've, we've been to, we were taking government subsidies for a period of about five years to go and pry solar panels off people's roofs <laughs> in the middle of the night. Yeah. We've mm. made your house cooler and more manly. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so Reeves told the Financial Times that her policy of securonomics, which is basically like, oh, no, that's, that's, that's a common, yes, seduce me, Rachel. No, that's a common, common expression. Okay, right. Um, had to be based it's on. Still stupid. So. Reeves told the Financial Times that her new policy of securonomics had to be based on, quote, the rock of fiscal responsibility. Amazing. On this rock of fiscal <laughs> responsibility, I shall build my church. Dwayne, the rock of fiscal responsibility so, junction. And, and, within, and within the rock of fiscal responsibility, uh, the sword of apathy. <laughs> Mm, We've yeah. embedded the rock of fiscal responsibility into <laughs> one the, corner of the carver. The, the <laughs> so, this is, I'll, I'll go further, that, but that it has to fit within her fiscal rules of taxation and spending. That means... It's, uh, it's so fucking ungrateful that we spent a good mm. ten years shooting birds into the path of wind turbines with t-shirt cannons, and this is how the government repays us, by still trying to decarbonize the economy. So... Our twenty-eight billion pound. Uh, now we are not as big as the as the U.S. To be fair, but the U.S. is spending three hundred sixty-nine billion dollars uh, on. Uh, that's just like on subsidies and tax breaks to like rapidly decarbonize the economy in a way that again will not and make the U.S. a more just country, but it will probably work. Right. Yeah, it will, will pro- give them the edge over China, and that's what matters. Yeah. And also yeah. us, but by accident, because they forgot to think about us. <laughs> we, we are clinging on to those coattails in NATO. Yeah. Well, you know? Why do you think yeah. Rishi sometimes, Sunak Sometimes is... the crumbs on the table are the nicest bet. Yeah. <laughs> well, why do you think Rishi Sunak is obsessed with trying to negotiate any kind of trade deal with the US? It's because we want to be inside the umbrella of the Inflation Reduction Act. We don't want to be competing with them. He's furious mm. that in the UK you still can't get, like, normal hot cheesos. You can only get the puffy ones. And so Those aren't even real ones. They're the ones that are imported from Poland. And what makes that yeah. doubly funny is that it is a group of a few hundred thousand 
sociopathic Scotch Irish loyalists who live in Northern Ireland who are basically more or less keeping that trade deal from happening. So that good. plus Biden's genuine antipathy to the UK as a country, <laughs> yeah. for which we can only respect him. <laughs> so. It's so funny if the if the Tories end up doing United Ireland, but just for the purposes of doing like more evil stuff. <laughs> like they're like, what the the big evil plan we have is so important that we can't be fucking around with Ireland anymore. Have it back. <laughs> so Reeves has also <laughs> promised to cut public debt as a share of GDP over five years, which will force her to reduce her 140 billion pound five year green program. She said the rules were paramount and that fiscal discipline is really, really important. The rules were paramount. Yep. And so that we will. I, I really hate that you have to like adopt this sort of head teacher ish aspect to be Chancellor of the Exchequer. But then again, considering the last guy who did it without doing that, it was just like, yeah, I'm going to get in there and fuck around was Kwasi Kwarteng. So, mm. yeah, uh, so it, it, colleagues, uh, one, one uh, colleague added, will tell you that Rachel knows how to say no. <laughs> Which is weird. Oh, because the, yeah. the Treasury in the totally unprecedented position of saying no to funding something. I what a fucking novelty that's going to be. I, I love so much how hard the, the Labour Party and to some extent the, Democrat, the Democratic Party in the US, their electoral strategy is constantly being like, you think our guy is good? Don't worry, he sucks. He sucks so bad. He's a punishing hang. He only ever says no. He would never eat a slice of birthday cake. And I just want you to rest assured that he will be chewing chips of ice throughout his entire <laughs> tenure in this office and making sure that nothing good ever happens. So, and, and, and what that, all that means, right? What, what, what you're discussing, that attitude, means that you're sort of taking the ultimate disciplinary institute of the neoliberal state and trying to put it in charge of something that's supposed to allow the functions of the state to continue. So when I say that we're putting dedicated neoliberals in charge of the thing that's supposed to replace it, uh, forgive me if I sort of worry that this will end up being a kind of paper exercise and maybe one or two turbines might get built. Maybe. Oh, no. The, the, oh, I, here's, here's what I think. I think, I, again, I think their hands are going to get forced by circumstance, right? And I, I, I think you can interpret this with the lens of the shock doctrine, right? Is that, like, this new ideology of, you know, wartime neoliberalism or, you know, big wet pussyism or whatever the fuck we're calling it, right? That's going to happen as we get to these, like, unsustainable, intolerable crises, uh, whether that's the NHS or whether that's the thing that's coming down the line next with, like, food security, or like water quality, uh, any number of these things, which will be like legitimate security issues, mm. and I think that kind of like, uh, you know, securitization, that kind of secure anarchs, is, is gonna like, really be the deciding factor, and what's great is, this is Keir Starmer's karmic punishment, right, mm. because we could have had a Prime Minister who would have loved to have done this shit, instead, we're getting a Prime Minister who is gonna hate it <laughs> every step of the way, who I is going to be yeah. forced to do the minimum viable socialism and, like, loudly complain the whole time. But I think that's kind of, like, telling about what's sort of acceptable when it comes to these mm. types of things anyway, because, like, even during COVID and the sort of, like, one thing that the Tories kind of did that was sort of good, uh, and I don't want to say it, but very much kind of, like, being forced to do, uh, like, furlough schemes, to do, like, to actually sort of, like, have to put money into the system in order to make it function, and Rishi Sunak sort of being the whole time like, yeah, actually, I hate doing this, and he and that was his job. His his job was literally to kind of, and like the reason he got valorized by like all the news like organizations were doing the very basic thing was because he was like, well, I actually kind of hate doing this, and I feel like maybe that's it. Like the acceptance is, I don't think Alice that you're completely right in the sense that like I think all the political parties kind of have to accept like circumstances are going to overshadow them and like it doesn't really matter what your policy position is because like it, none none of it is going to matter anyway mm. and so really all the labor party kind of has to do is kind of perf just all they have to do is save a line and the line is like we're not going to do anything but also if we're going to do anything i promise that we're going to say that we really hate doing it. And also, everyone's going to hate it. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah it and, and it's also going to be like the worst version of it. I, we promise you, everything is still going to be shit. 
It's very, it's very like the British version of the Philosopher King that the only man worthy of being Prime Minister is a guy who's having a miserable time. Like a guy, <laughs> a guy who just hates it. A guy for whom the act of governing is disgusting to him. <laughs> so if I, here's, here's one for Viola. You're going to enjoy this okay. next line. If the choice is between the green prosperity plan, so, you know, fighting climate change and adapting... Sure, the thing where we don't die, yeah. And the fiscal rules, the fiscal rules will trump the former. Great. Fantastic! Cool. Great. Yeah, <laughs> we'll have that tenor. Yeah, we're just like it's just like cooking twenty-year-old tin of beans around a fire with your kids in like a wasteland, and you're just like, well, you see, the fiscal rules were more important. And I mean, you understand why the fiscal rules? You understand on one hand why they sort of do have to say that because they will need if they're going to borrow to invest, they need to stop scaring international bond markets. Mm. But at the same time, none of that matters if you have failed to avert the existential risk. Mm. Yeah, basically. So this is I, I, we're going a little long, but I think it's worth doing that a little bit. Mm. As you, this is from her her paper that she recently released, which again I read all of because I love my life. It's fun, isn't and it? You love economics. Yeah, I did. Uh, just a brief start by here. It's fun, isn't it, to think about at what point in the you know, given that the sky in New York is currently orange, um, like at what point will like the bond markets and financial markets in general start like pricing in to their financial risk assessments the fact that it could all just be over by the time this bill comes to you like kind of being like well they're gonna owe that money to him but his office is in san diego so i reckon there's a good chance that'll have burned down by the time that they have to pay that money so in a way that's not really a debt at all well if you want to um i have i have an answer which is that this is already happening in the insurance industry Mm -hmm. if you want to try and like insure like uh property in florida or Mm. california for instance Mm. over a long term um, that you you can't do it in a lot of ooh, cases. Ooh, sorry. A lot of places I, will become uninsurable before they become uninhabitable. One uh, huh. one interesting thing about the Florida thing is that's that's part of the answer, but not the whole answer. The real actual mm. whole answer is that, and this is super fucking weird, um, is that a Insurance bunch of companies have gone woke. A bunch of small business guys and lawyers and like local lawyers uh, have got together in Florida to essentially rewrite. The insurance um, insurance codes such that insur- it's insurers now have to pay such enormous payouts on even stuff that doesn't happen. Like they will just have what? to pay to replace. Yeah, it's so fucking bizarre. But it's more of a in Florida itself. Weirdly, it's more of a local corruption story. Amazing. In California, it's it's definitely that though. You have to pay out insurance perhaps on stuff that doesn't happen. Really flying in the face <laughs> of the whole point of the insurance industry. <laughs> there. I, I, that's a that's a huge, massive oversimplification. I want to do a whole episode on Florida insurance actually at some point. Mm. Um, I look forward to finding whatever the really dumb joke is in that. <laughs> ah, that's the business model, baby. Uh, no. I'm come, Dracula, the insurer of Florida. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I we'll get to banish come, Dracula, to the fucking lagoon. Yeah. I want to drink your cum. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how we're going to get there in the yeah, Florida yeah, insurance yeah, yeah. episode, but trust yeah. us, we will. Can't get come, Dracula insurance in Florida anymore. They're rife. <laughs> so, my balls are dry, sunshine. This is from Ra- Rachel Reeves' paper, A New Business Model for Britain. Oh, boy. Yeah. The defining mission of the next Labour government will be to secure the highest sustained growth in the G7. Well, considering mm. our economy is growing at, what, 0.5% right now? Um, with good jobs and productivity growth in every part of the country. So, see that good jobs and productivity growth in every part of the country? It's pretty much yeah, one yeah. for one. What if I want a bad job? <laughs> yeah, well, like you have one. Oh, yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to meet that mission, Labour will pursue a modern supply side agenda. So not like that antiquated mm. supply side agenda pursued in the 1980s, where uh. they didn't securitize a few more industries, but a modern one. Yeah, uh, there's going to be an ape. Yeah, we will forge a new partnership with the private sector. Again, finally, a new one. All the previous ones didn't work, but I'm sure one more they're going to do the trick. Um, so firms can invest, grow, and create decent, well-paid work in the process. Um, all told, we will make Britain's economy stronger and more resilient to shocks that an uncertain world will invariably throw at us. So this is the idea of subsidizing these productive, often regional jobs to then revitalize the regions of the country by saying, okay, well, the new wind turbine factory is going to go where the old um, steel mill was, right? Uh, mm. This is what's happening. The, the, this is part of the plan in, 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 in the US. Also, there's no plan yeah. to like, even if, even... And correct me if I'm wrong, like I'm missing something here. But like, so the idea is that you want to create, you want to make their economy more resilient. And you also need like long term sustainable jobs, which can allow that. Because the problem right now is that 
the job you know that there is too much insecurity which mm. means that the shocks can't be absorbed and yep. and a lot of that lack of resilience is because a lot of the utilities and services are kind of like either entirely privatized or mostly privatized yeah and outsourced correct and so but their, her solution isn't to be like okay well we're gonna create resilience by having control of like utilities no and the workers around that to make sure that everyone is still able to get basic supplies her thing is we're gonna we're gonna try we're gonna forge a new relationship with all these outsourcers all these contractors all these sort of other firms and like well this, yep. we'll figure it out but so am, am i correct in like that analysis you're not or? you're not far wrong right um because well the part of the idea right and again this requires problems that they don't seem committed to solving whether this is just because it's wonkish right but um sort of like marginal pricing of energy is one of the reasons that we're in this giant mess that we're in which i've talked about in the past but i'll remind you is that the price of energy is set by the highest price dirtiest f source of energy so if natural gas is $100, let's say, per kilowatt hour, then even though wind is free to produce and basically free to distribute, you can still charge $100 per kilowatt hour, which is the way that they were trying to incentivize and de-risk people starting to build wind turbines. But that means that no matter how much green energy we build, until you get rid of that way of pricing it, which I don't think anyone in the industry is going to particularly like, um, then it then you're still it doesn't matter like how many of these like turbine manufacturers you invest in just it's not going to reduce the price of energy but you might want not have to depend on someone else for it right you you mm. no one will be able to threaten to turn off your lights essentially fantastic okay well uh, that's good isn't it yeah so but this isn't this so i i've that so i've, I've sort of glossed what's in the, the description of what they're going to do right but this is the section a new deal for working people and a new deal mm. it is fucking not uh, and they, they starts off as saying a genuine living wage, none of these fake living wages that we've been seeing. Right, yeah. Genuine. A new one. Uh, a job security mm -hmm. that ensures workers aren't exploited and standards that guarantee a safe and fair workplace. Fine. Stronger collective bargaining rights? Great. Um, but they, they talk about um, up updating our inefficient and outdated in, uh, industrial relations framework. Uh, again, fine. But they, they're seeing unions mostly in their current state in the UK, which is like defensive organizations. Um, mm -hmm. But that most of this is saying that the way that this is going to be solved is through things like higher wages, greater job security, and more empowerment, leading to better motivated the, the, workers. The good jobs yeah. lever. Yeah, this mm. is this is basically just the good jobs lever. And yes, good jobs, extremely important, and mostly defended by strong trade unions. All of that is true. Mm -hmm. Well, first um, of all, they're going to have to build the good jobs lever, and that's probably it's probably going to be a very big lever because they're yeah. going to make a lot of jobs. So that's probably going to create some jobs too. But right. The, the Danish government will be building the good jobs lever. And, <laughs> of course. And we talk about the... Um, and we did, but to, this is much less concerned with things like benefits. And one of the reasons that benefits are important is that they make your job better because they allow you to leave it without threatening you with um, destitution. Oh. Also, things like having an actually funded and effective NHS is not really part of the Reevesonomics plan, especially because... Of course not. Yeah. Now, the, and, and, you know, they say we need we need strong public services. We need a functioning NHS. Right. So Rachel Reeves is saying, oh, these things need to be good. But you never hear the plan as to how. However, if you sort of connect a few things together, you can also look, OK, well, what does Starmer say when he talks about the NHS, when he talks about public services? Because there is a real allergy. And again, this is going to come back to something Alice said earlier, which is reform may be mm. forced upon them, the kinds of mm, reforms they sure. don't want to do is one of the things that they want to avoid doing is removing the fake internal markets that were sort of created to um, uh, sort of govern healthcare and education in this country, right? Yeah, is and that NHS trusts or like uh, yeah. education authorities, stuff like this. Yeah, and the, this is something, again, in the reaction to the sort of the Corbyn manifestos, they say, oh, we, don't, we think that if you if sort of are dicking around with, um, you know, the oh, massive top-down reorganizations, you're forgetting people's real priorities, despite the fact that the way that these things are organized specifically gets in the way of them delivering good services. Yeah. Oh, right. why Why are you fiddling around with, you know, the way that the NHS works when people care about their health care? And it's like, yeah, the, 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 there's, there's an obvious relationship between those two things. <laughs> yeah. It's so, like someone going like, ah, oh, the soldiers on the front lines don't need people making the bullets. They need people there shooting the bullets. And it's like, well, no, <laughs> you see. Yeah. So... But this is this is what I mean, right? There is very little appetite within this 
um, way of, of envisioning and organizing the economy for things like a strong Keynesian welfare state, for things like redistribution and for things like, like actual resilient public services. Because the stuff in the NHS is crazy. I, I remember like reading a bit about it last year. And the extent to which there are just huge amounts of money that are like ceremonially wasted in the NHS doing nothing, but just purely because of like various internal markets that have been created and just like, ah, oh, yes, well, then what we have to do is we have to buy 100 million units of this drug and then we have to throw it away because of a PFI contract that <laughs> makes us do that every yep. year. I'd love to change this light bulb, but it's going to cost 1500 pounds to get someone <laughs> from Circo to come look at it. And then, you know, mm -hmm. anyway, we have to call the uh, the Sudanese government for some reason. That's an expensive call. And then they have to call the Danish government. <laughs> so this is um, this. But they, but they talk about like, oh, we need strong public services like the NHS and schools and stuff in order to make sure that people can mm. work better. Yeah. All of it comes around. You know, what? it's it is Starship Troopers. Economic service guarantees citizenship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, all of the, you know, loads of the nurses uh, left and went to work in other places because the wages weren't high enough. We weren't going to pay them anymore because that'd be too expensive. So now what we've had to do to cover the nurses is we've had to get in a bunch of agency nurses um, and they cost a lot more than the pay rise for the nurses would have cost. And also the standard of care is lower, but it was a saving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's capital spend rather than staffing spend. And those are different because the money's different. Exactly. It's different kinds of money. Yeah. It comes out of different pots. Yeah. Are you telling me all these pots are coming out of the same pipe? Good money and bad money. Yeah. Yeah. So this mm -hmm. is, we yeah. talk, look at what Starmer talks about, about a functional NHS, is he says that, look, the NHS, it, it needs to work and everyone wants it to work, but we have mm. to be hard-nosed about reform. And this is what you hear Streeting talking about. And, yeah. and when you want to talk about, and when, when Reeves is promising through Reevesonomics, which will somehow, without borrowing anything, and in fact, reducing the debt as a percentage of GDP, without taxing anything and without like without doing anything necessary right is going to <laughs> i will remain completely unhurt <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <But> is, <laughs> is going to do all of this it's okay well are you going to actually spend the not just spend the money on like healthcare and education but are you going to reorganize it so it, much of it doesn't just go to these strange broken internal markets so i'll go back to what i was saying earlier which is uh, what something alice was saying which is if you're you're going to have to confront these internal markets and you don't want to and so you're going to no. confront them in a minimalist way, and it's going to be just enough to keep it ticking over until eventually you, the, the whole internal market ends up being sort of ceremonial. Mm. But I'm, how I'm very scared of markets. I went to a market once in Morocco. And I've got a, <laughs> there was a, quite a heated discussion with a man about the price of a carpet. Yeah, so and, and this is... And we, we, I much prefer shopping on Amazon. And the, mag the magic money tree is, is gone, but it's replaced yeah. by the kindly wizard in the form of AI. Ah, the kindly oh, wizard. Yeah. So, uh, Starmer says, the NHS, just look at it. The a <laughs> a a <laughs> In fact, <laughs> yeah. the Oxford English Dictionary defines the NHS as unaccustomed it, as I am to public speaking. Starmer's slowly turning into Brian Butterfield. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, okay. The NHS, just look at it. The eight o'clock scramble. The appointments missed. Opportunities missed. To spot the pain that turned out to be a tumour. Fucking hell. <laughs> it's really... <laughs> oh, sentence one key. Okay. <laughs> Patients who want to go home are well enough to go home, but who have to stay in hospital for months waiting for a care package. Yeah, the call of duty. Um, <laughs> Day-long waits at A&E, record numbers off work sick, people pulling their own teeth out. Yeah, like the people listening to you talk. Seven million on waiting, waiting, waiting list. Who's yeah. writing this? Uh, it's the world's most charismatic man. Yeah. Uh, mm. It says... I don't think the, he says, I'll, I'll take it from here. I don't think the NHS survives more, five more years of Tory government. Yeah, it probably doesn't. Mm. Um, people can say we've heard this before. The Labour Party is always it saying... It could survive six more years of me. <laughs> people uh, <laughs> are always saying that the Labour Party is always saying it's time to save the NHS. But I say, look squarely in the eyes of the people who work at the NHS and ask them. But mark my words, if all we do in the Labour Party is place the NHS on a pedestal and leave it there, that's not good enough either. So don't worry, mm. we're still going to mutilate it. But we're yeah, going to mutilate it respectfully, unlike the Tories. So it, it, this okay. is the thing, right? We got to fix like the one of those artistic serial killers. <laughs> so we have to fix the fundamentals, renew its purpose and make it fit for the future. Um, that's what this mission is about. But again, none of that's going to involve attacking the actual root, root causes, even though the as you say, right, this is going to become a kind of security issue sooner rather than later because mm. 
all of a sudden, when you can't just outsource all of your complicated or difficult or expensive problems to cheap foreign energy or cheap or, or um, like cheap labor overseas or whatever, when those things start coming home, then all of a sudden your ability to reproduce society, that becomes a security issue and everything is connected to it. And the amount of it that's going to become a security issue is going to expand and grow. And so well, it already is. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, but consider, for instance, more heat waves and worse, mm. uh, and what that's going to do to our beloved economy and our beloved good jobs leader. You're going to have to swear me the NHS. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so maybe, let's start there. We need an NHS free at the point of view. It's paid for by taxation. But then it asks, what do we need to change? And what are the challenges, the opportunities, <laughs> yeah, the problems? How can we save lives, improve lives, provide more dignity, innovation? Where could it be found? People. How do we unlock their purpose? <laughs> it's getting sort of increasingly Warhammer. Uh, technology. How do we make it work for us? And when you've asked those searching questions, you turn back, you roll up your sleeves, and you crank your hog. <laughs> you face reality. Yeah. So this is, right, so what he's talking about, right, is the, is he's unable to start to, he's unable to confront this problem, uh, except by saying there will still need to be reductions. We will still need to find efficiencies. And how do you do that, right? How you do that is there partly, again, some things yeah. that will kind of work in a de minimis way, right? Like trying to fund social care. But again, who are you funding? Are you funding it directly from the councils? Or are you funding a bunch of the private outsourcers who will like take on one old man for like 40 billion pounds a month? Yeah, the one, one old man is being treated by 15 guys from Circo. He used to be in the prisoner transport division. <laughs> guys in riot gear turning up to help you take a shit. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so what's really striking in this document, though, is that pay is mentioned like once. Oh. Yeah. Increasing the pay of the, of the staff who are chronically short, for, shortfallen because we don't pay them enough. So we right. talk a lot I about... Can, can't afford to do that until we've cranked the good jobs lever all the way up. Yeah. Not including theirs jobs, though. Mm -hmm. Their <laughs> jobs, uh, no, those are bad jobs. But we'll, we'll get some more good jobs in, like, other sectors of the economy and hope that sort of, like, lifts all boats, you know? Well, and so he also talks about um, trying to do more preventative healthcare, which would be fine. It says, the fact that he's, sure. he says, we'll change advertising rules and we'll make sure that products which are harmful to our children's health, such as vaping and sugary snacks, cannot be advertised <laughs> in Britain. All the flavors will have to be changed to names like they have in New Zealand. Such <laughs> so, as the hairy growl of eight. <laughs> so, the move from the analog to the digital NHS. A tomorrow service, not just a today service. Okay. Uh -huh. Whatever cool. that means. Thanks, Kia. If we give an example, 33 million people downloaded the NHS app during the pandemic. And it's a good app. What a great way it to start. It worked so many times. Labor would take the app and innovations like it, would deepen them, expand them, and put them in the hands of patients and use them to transform our relationship with the NHS. Um, I mean, and again, like, sure, that would be great, but the fact that you're going to be heavily just relying- just want to see a doctor, man. I, mm. my, my fucking GP runs out of appointments at 8.32 in the morning, mm -hmm. dude, and I don't- uh, What is an AI going to do for me? What is an app going to do for me? Uh, that you know could not be done better by hiring more fucking doctors. I mean, also this is basically sort of saying that like after a very long time of being told do not do not go on web MD and like diagnose yourself to be mm -hmm. like, well, we're going to give you lots of different ways to diagnose yourself, mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. you well, might get the diagnosis and wrong. Yourself. You're going to get some little like self care tips off of the app because that's all you're fucking guessing. Well, you, well, you might get yeah. the diagnosis wrong, or you might get it right, but ultimately the material thing because like ultimately it's like, well, okay. Mm -hmm. If I'm able to use one of these apps to like determine what I might have, I still kind of need medicine to sort of figure that yeah. out. So you're gonna well, like, but then you've got the guy from down the pub who's now <laughs> been fast tracked to be a doctor because <laughs> he read like a pamphlet about it while he was having six pints of Stella, and now he's my, a doctor. My favorite example of this is poor pharmacists as a profession because. Of all the, the like people that we've roped in, like, you know, retired doctors, the ambulance service, people from the town and stuff, your mm. regular ass local chemist is now essentially being asked to do open heart surgery just like in their own waiting area. 
It's great. I love that shit. I cannot mm. get enough of it. Every like week that goes past, you get an announcement that like some new thing that like you used to have to be a doctor for is now that that's just being dumped on pharmacists as well. Mm. So yeah, by all means, you know, fuck it. If I if I need like a transplant, I guess I'll just get my dentist to do that because he's kind yeah. of like a like a fucking surgeon. The, the new the new service should be like kind of like when like the you know both pilots are incapacitated on a plane and just like one of the guys from the plane who's like really good at driving yeah. has to land the plane and he's getting talked <laughs> through it by aircraft control they're like oh yeah you've got a blocked artery so what you're gonna need to do is um have you got a scalpel oh, kitchen knife will do he's dead yeah they're just like they're just talking you through doing surgery on yourself <laughs> so basically <laughs> Cut right the blue why at what the, the, in a q a after the speech right Starmer was asked how this would be funded, right? Because a lot of what he's talking about is uplifting the service. Like That's the great bit. It won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, just, he's talking about uplifting the service, not, not reorganizing or transforming the service, not dealing with like perverse incentives created by internal markets. But yeah, it, it, if Britain could focus more on preventative health care and getting people out of beds through social care, if we could actually hire more doctors if we could pay them more i mean again pay mentioned once and it only refers to fairly not anything like world leading or whatever nothing like that but never mind right then yeah that would be much better for everybody who lives here um and so when he asked about nhs funding well, that's the last thing we want is britain <laughs> when Come asked on now. about nhs funding he said technology can do what money can't uh-huh well, uh, like suck your dick do you remember a little phrase i like to use called all we can do is the impossible yeah <laughs> well, he talked about the potential of AI, for example, to save <laughs> countless lives, which again is true because AI is good in a medical <laughs> setting uh, because it's, it's solving bounded but difficult problems like spotting tumors in, in lungs and stuff. It's actually pretty good at that. But the idea that like the potential of AI to save countless lives and establishing incentives to innovate throughout the system, we've invented a health system that works and breaking it and saying, all right, someone invent a way that works, but for free. Mm. It's a great it's a great time mm. to say it too, especially after like that story about the um the helpline, the suicide helpline mm. that yeah, yeah, went yeah. to AI and that being and that uh bot telling people to go kill themselves. So good news. You can get mental health care on the NHS now. Bad news. <laughs> it is it, it is being delivered by a computerized Harold Shipman. The bot <laughs> the bot was the only person giving its honest opinion. Yeah. <laughs> the ball was like, yeah, that does sound pretty fucked up. So the um the the Starmer speech concludes: old values, new opportunities, technology and science, convenience and control, renewal, not decline, an NHS not just off its knees, but running confidently towards the future. <laughs> <laughs> twirling, twirling, twirling yeah. towards freedom. Amazing. So look, I mean, I I. I think that Matt Hancock is back and he's in the Labour Party. <laughs> <laughs> so look, I, it's I, only a matter of time. I, I I do think that like this. This is a bit of a, a coming together of lots and lots of different things. Whether we're ta whether we're remember the episode we did with Brian Quimby about the like fake electric car startup that that like brought false yeah. hope that Music Man style to like a town in the Ohio River. But it's also like that book about the dignity of work by Lord Crudus. Uh, it's also about um, like the uh, 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 various like you know, securonomics supply chain stuff. Like all of these things are the transformations that are now being finally reacted to, too little too late, uh, and in ways that do not touch the various third rails that will have to be touched if, it, if it's going to work, but nevertheless, in politics, in ways that I think are different enough to understand through a different set of concepts than neoliberalism. It just feels like the new Labour Party manifesto, really, or the new Labour Party idea, because it's not a manifesto, it's very much the idea of like, well, we're just going to like accumulate a bunch of things uh, I'm really just trying to fit in a reference here, which is uh, accumulate lots of things into a big, uh, a big pussy. Yeah. I can't do it. I can't. I, I'm, oh, I'm done. We are, done. We are going to stuff a bunch of new technology into the NHS's big loose pussy. That's I right. Can't believe that that was the running gag. <laughs> for this that one. The of voice. crucial BLP outcomes. We're All going right. to we're going to cram a load of services into the NHS's big loose. Oh, God. <laughs> Awful. Thank you. Very right. important. All right. All right. All right. All right. Uh, I think one, that's... That, one that as a nation we all respect. Mm -hmm. That's it. For <laughs> we today. don't sexualize. The I'm big calling loose pussy that gave birth to us all, uh, and to which we must all one day return. I am. I am. <laughs> I am calling time on this particular episode. Thank you for listening to this.
there will be a bonus episode. It will be five dollars. There also are going to be other bonus episodes. Climb written into ology. our big loose pussy on Patreon. Writtenology, <laughs> and then our big loose Patreon. Warm, yeah, that's right. Cozy trash future pussy. There are going to be. <laughs> Uh, two episodes as well on the ten dollar tier. Extra Britonologies and Writtenologies. There's a stream Thursdays and Mondays from nine to eleven UK time. Uh, I'm usually on it. I won't be this evening. Well, when you listen to this, Fuck I might sake. be, but I won't be this evening from me being recording it. Yeah, at some point in the past. So if you're sitting here right now wondering, I wonder why Riley wasn't on the stream some days ago. That's why <laughs> I'm going for dinner at my cousin's. Yeah, so if you want to track Riley down some days in the past, <laughs> go go to Riley's cousin's house. Stepping out of a time machine. <laughs> You're like, why weren't you on the stream? Yeah. I mean, we were talking beforehand about uh, Hussein. It's a really hot day today in London, and Hussein arrived in a coat. It was. Uh, it and wasn't I was hot. You time traveled, but just from like trivially. It wasn't like, hot in the this future. morning. <laughs> Look, yeah. it was it was chilly this morning. It was a reasonable. It was a reasonable. <laughs> I'm wearing a t-shirt underneath it. It's a reasonable like thing to have right now. Mm-hmm. No, no, you, it was fine. You time traveled to bring uh, yeah. a warning from November. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, but, be cold. No, but like also bearing in mind the trajectory, November could actually be very, very hot. So yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Actually, and I could still just yeah. be wearing my jacket. Like, well, it's still November. It's still yeah. jacket weather. I'm gonna wear this, it. You could reasonably be bringing a warning from possibly- November. This is quite possibly the worst thing to happen to us, like me and Hussein, people who like a coat, like a jacket, is mm. yeah. the apocalypse where it gets hotter. Like, yeah. why did it have to be that? Why that? I like the idea that no matter what the weather, Hussein's constant is a winter coat. So, and then he just has to adjust his other clothing around it. So if it's really hot, you've just got to do the I like lingerie under a coat. I mean, thing. I have, I, I have, <laughs> I have done like the vest underneath Princess the jacket Diana. before. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, so I am getting there. All mm. right, all right. Mm. Um. Enough futzing about, uh, I think I've done all the promos. Oh, yeah, tour, tour dates for me. Uh, if you want to see me in Manchester, it's too late. You should have bought tickets <laughs> earlier, you dogs. Yeah, you should have gone back um, in time and gotten tickets to go see me in um, Manchester. <laughs> this week in London. What is there a row in Manchester with all in big coats? That's right. Uh, yeah, they'll all sell you meat at the pub afterwards. Um, yeah, this, this week on Wednesday, the 14th of June, I will be doing, uh, that almost went a bit Jimmy Savile there, um, I'll be doing a show in London uh, at the Secford. It's a preview of the new show. Uh, there will also be a show in Bristol on June 23rd. Mm-hmm. 23rd, I want to say. Uh, come to that. Uh, there will be shows in July also. I can't remember, but there's, there's a bunch of dates on my website. You can pick the show that's nearest to you. Mm-hmm. That's your, right. And are you going to be in Scotland on August the 4th? Mm, are you? We will... Ask yourself. Also be there at the Fringe yeah, on that's August right. the 4th. Yeah, uh, the TF live show will be on the August the 4th. I don't know if it's on sale yet, but it will be on sale soon. Mm. And uh, yeah, my show will also be running every, every fucking day. Yeah, you're going to love that. Anyway. It's at day. noon. Yeah, it's at it's noon. It's such a bad time of day for a comedy show. What but, else are you come. doing? You're at, it's lunch, noon. Lunch, ridiculous. Yeah. Get the no, fuck out It's of here. pre-lunch. The show. You're yeah. pre-lunching your lunch by yeah. coming to my stand-up show, and yeah. then you go and eat and be like, what a lovely time we had. Mm-hmm. That's exactly it. Anyway, uh, anything else to plug? Uh, no, nothing to plug. All right. Don't think so. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.